Well, hello and welcome to Man the Nether Manhattan Institute event cast, which today <clears throat> we're simulcasting for my podcast, The Last Optimist. I'm Mark Mills. I've got laryngitis. You can hear my apologies. So the gift to my guest will be he'll be talking more than me for a change. Uh, I'm a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. And today we're going to explore the uh, missteps that created the energy dependencies and vulnerabilities that the United States and Europe are now seeing in stark <clears throat> highlights because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Joining me for this uh, conversation is the well-known and estimable Dan Jurgen, vice chairman of IHS Markets, no. now an S&P Global company, expert on all things oil. Dan is also an accomplished and Pulitzer Prize, Prize winning author. I'm jealous, Dan. His most recent book, which I talked about with him a year ago on this forum, is titled The New, the New Map, Energy, Climate, and the Clash of Nations. That book and its subtitles tagline were profoundly prescient. Welcome, Dan. Thanks for Thank joining you. me. Glad to be back with you. And uh, despite your laryngitis, I recognize that you're still an optimist. <laughs> you got that right. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm not optimistic about my voice getting through our conversation, but let me let me kick, kick this off to have everybody know. First, uh, your book is now out in paperback, right? Right. A new edition. The new edition paperback. Uh, this this is as all Dan's books are. Uh, exquisitely written, just a really uh, great fluid writer, but also great insights in uh, an addressable way. Uh, let me kick off our conversation by reading a paragraph from your book that's profoundly prophetic. It's great to be a prophet and be right so quickly. <laughs> so here's America's new map. Of course, the book is about the maps, a way of thinking about the architecture of energy. America's new map tells a story of the unanticipated shale revolution that's transforming America's place in the world, upending world energy markets and resetting global geopolitical geopolitics. Russia's map is about the tinder created by the interaction of energy flows, geopolitical competition, and the continuing contention over the unsettled borders that resulted from the collapse of the Soviet Union three decades ago and from Vladimir Putin's drive to restore Russia as a great power. Russia may be an energy superpower, but it is also economically dependent on oil and gas exports. Today, as in Soviet times, those exports are stoking fierce debate about the possible political leverage over Europe that may come in their wake. Dan, wow. What, wow. Were you, were, did you nail it or what? Oh, so... Let me just, this is a softball for you, but <laughs> you got it right. You could take a victory lap. Did you think you'd be that right that soon? No, I didn't. Uh, uh, you know, and I had a line, and I think it's page 78, saying that Ukraine was the issue that would blow up between the United States and Russia. But I never, you know, I did not imagine this kind of reckless, uh, brutal war being waged uh, by Vladimir Putin. But it, you could certainly see that he simply rejected the end of the uh, the way the Cold War ended. Uh, he wanted to restore Russia as a great power and dominating or swallowing up Ukraine was, uh, uh, you know, ta one of the task number ones for him. And of course, as you pointed out in your book and everybody has learned since you know, people, these ex well, it's sort of the, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia is X-rayed the state of, of the world's energy dependencies. And people have noticed that Europe gets 40% of its natural gas from Russia and a quarter of its oil from Russia. Germany's even more dependent. And what you wrote about was, I would phrase it this way, the long tail of these dependencies. This is a long story. Your first book <clears throat> was really about the long, long, long tail of uh, global energy markets, especially oil. Uh, you and I have both been fighting the narrative of how quick things could change, sort of the mythology of rapid change in energy markets and how difficult it is to make changes. Uh, high level, yeah, I have an opinion, which I'll share, I've shared before. But Europe's in a box. The United States is in a box, given what's happened in the last two decades. Uh, the German chancellor, I think, yesterday said that there are no plans to sanction and ban the imports of Russian oil and gas. Yes, there are. <laughs> well, that's that's where I'm going. So you... I, what, 
what are what are his options? What are our well, our options? Are easy. We don't we don't buy a lot of their gas and oil. No, no, we don't buy any of their uh, gas. Uh, although occasionally. Oh. Russian LNG has arrived in Boston Harbor because exactly. you can't build a pipeline across New York State to send cheap Marcellus gas. So you import <laughs> LNG into Boston. Uh, we were importing minor amounts of Russian oil. We've stopped. You know, it was pretty easy to adjust to that. Yeah. Quite different is the state of Europe. And of course, you, you know what Europe, I mean, there was Germany shut down its nuclear program. But I think Europe saw Russia as our neighbor. And let's get Russia integrated into the global economy. They'll sell us energy. We'll sell them things. And this will help create this uh, post-Cold War uh, era. And, you know, in some ways that clearly worked. Uh, but uh, what it didn't work was as, as Putin went into his 15th and his 17th and his 20th and his 22nd year as president of Russia, uh, the game changed and it became yeah. a more and more authoritarian society. And right now, indeed, the issue is how uh, uh, that Russia this year will earn, we estimate, about $250 billion at current prices from exporting oil and gas yeah. uh, to Europe. And I think the pressure is growing. They've banned coal. Uh, I think that, uh, that what's happened in the last couple of weeks, the revelations that have come out, what's going to happen with the battle in the Donbass, whether chemical weapons get used, I think the pressures to... Uh, put a, a ban uh, on or reduce the dependence on Russian oil and gas to reduce the money going to the Kremlin will grow. Uh, now, the counter fact is, what does that do to the domestic economies? And the answer is you get uh, Mar uh, Marine Le Pen doing very well in the French presidential election. Yeah. <clears throat> and so I think what happens over the next uh, a week from Sunday will be very critical for what happens. But I think that uh, there, there will be moves to uh, sanction at least some kinds of Russian oil. And I think a uh, tougher one is gas uh, because of fear of recession and economic upheaval. But I think things will start to move in, in that direction too. And just Mark, just to add one other thing, when the sanctions, these massive sanctions were first put on Russia, when they invade it, the idea was let's not, uh, energy's too too controversial, too dependent to do it. But I think over after almost two months of war, it's just a different perspective now, particularly when you see what's been done and happened. Yeah, I think I think you're right. In fact, I, I've written this and I'm going to keep saying it. I think this is a, a great reality energy reset that's going to happen. It's got a long, <clears throat> a long tail that's going to go through um, Europe and the United States as we think about how to adjust uh, plans and aspirations around this. I don't think for a minute that the nations of Europe or our nation will abandon the so-called transition plans for energy, for wind, solar, and batteries. But I think what will happen now is more of a real politic, to use the old phrase, on how long and how easy it is to dealing from oil and gas and what the alternatives are in a relatively near term. You know, oil is much easier, as you know better than I do. It's more fungible, easier to, to shift to supply sources. Gas is a bigger problem because pipes, they have to go by pipe or, or expensive and now right. limited LNG ships. Well, one thing that's made a huge difference is <clears throat> U.S. LNG. And, uh, you know, sometimes thing has to catch up with reality. Six <laughs> years ago, the, the U.S. really sent its first modern <laughs> shipment of LNG uh, uh, from uh, uh, the Gulf Coast. Today, this year, the U.S. is going to be the largest exporter of LNG. And it has become essential. I just uh, saw uh, representatives who are here from a European government basically looking for more LNG in the United right. States. Right. And, and U.S. LNG now has become not only a strategic asset for the United States, but an incredibly important strategic asset for Europe. And uh, what a change that was. And, you know, it's only this has only happened. This development, this growth is over six years. Yeah. No, I, no, no, it was a long time coming, including yeah. a lot of permitting and a lot of construction, but it's happening. Well, of course, that's the challenge now is that the European buyers can petition American producers, which are, of course, private companies, to enter into contracts to build pipes, more pipes, which we can do pretty quickly, more LNG terminals, which takes a little time. But currently, I mean, I, you, you may have a better feeling on the pulse of this. I don't see any evidence collaterally of, uh, let's say, uh, 
a warp speed for regulatory permitting to make it faster and easier to get these facilities built to export the gas. We certainly have it. We certainly have the capacity to do it, but it almost feels like we have two narratives. You know, we're talking about the power we have to get more gas to Europe. We have a lot of power to do that, but we aren't, we aren't making it as far as I can see the very challenging political decisions to make it easier for those companies to do it. Yeah. Yeah. We have two, um, there'll be some additional U S LNG coming on stream this year, but yeah. permitting is a great bottleneck and there, there's now an effort to let's say speed it up, but permitting in the United States is really complicated. And often it's not just one authority, but it's many different authorities. I mean, to build a pipeline, you might deal with seven or eight different regulatory agencies, yeah. any one of which can block it as we've seen with this mountain Valley pipeline, uh, that's mostly built to take cheap gas from the Marcellus down into right. Virginia. But that, I think it's the last 20 or 30 miles of the 350 mile pipeline is just hung up in permitting problems. Right. And these, and the, the reality is this to use the uh, famous phrase made by a former president, you know, I have a pen, um, a stroke of a pen from Congress for a president can make a difference to the complexities of regulations. They can't make a difference to the velocity of energy production other than the regulatory side of it. Cause it's, so I, you know, I'm I color me uh, dubious that um, it, we're going to see a change in that. But it, I think your point is the right one: is that as the the horrific nature of what's going on in Ukraine is on daily, nightly news, and it, it as it get worse, it looks like it's going to get worse. I think the pressure to do something to enable Europe to sanction the money flows to Russia will have to come from a response mainly in two jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. One is ours, of course, to get the permitting. And the other is the Middle East, mainly, mainly Qatar and Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> right. But there is, uh, there's one other thing that is going on, which is a process of self-sanctioning where, true, uh, true. where if Russia exports between three and a half, four million barrels a day of oil and oil products to Europe, somewhere between maybe one to three of that is being disrupted because companies are just saying, sure. refiners saying we're not going to refine it. Uh, banks say we will not issue uh, short-term credit finance. Uh, tankers say we, tanker companies say we won't pick it up, and that's that's growing. And we've seen trading companies now sort of backing away, as well. And that's the mess. You know, it's been a strong message from Ukraine. And yeah. so, even yeah. if you don't get the official sanctions, gas is the, the oil is more manageable. Oil is tough, but it's more manageable. Gas is the hard problem. The hardest know. problem. And for, but not to push back diplomatically because you're the sage of oil <laughs> my, energy, my, guess, <laughs> my uh my guess is as you know because oil is so fungible that the uh turn away self-sanctioning by a lot of jurisdictions will be picked up by pakistan india other nations that are that are willing so partly they, partly partly yeah. i think that's true india's you know india imports 85 percent of its oil so oil price goes up that's a really big hit to gdp <clears throat> so they'll say and they'll say the russians would like to buy it but would like a 40 percent discount oh. and by the way we don't want to pay in dollars we want to pay in rupees oh, i know and so and, and well, i that, think but I, but I think there'll be limits i don't think there will be a one-to-one -one shift in the barrel i think there are too many there'll be too many impediments in the system well even, and, and let me say this month it looks like russian oil production in april is going to be down somewhere between six to ten percent of what it was last month, showing the impact. Yeah, and that's significant. And I, and I agree. Even if it was one for one, uh, the magnitude of the discounts that they have to sell it for is another form of sanctioning that will be right. significant. Like speaking of gas, because gas is a tough one because it is a longer, longer leg. <clears throat> Let me read another paragraph, short one, from the the the, the, the sage of oil and gas. <laughs> the previous December of 2019 have been marked both by the inauguration ceremony for the power of Siberia pipeline and Trump's signing into law, the sanctions on Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Well, you know, you went on to elaborate on that, but we've since sanctioned the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. The Trans-Siberian, of course, moves a lot of gas to China, but that was your launching point to, to look at this entanglement, the geopolitical map entanglement of gas in particular from Russia to China. Right. Well, I think that um, it's interesting to note, it's more than interesting, but it's <laughs> helpful in the present context to realize that when the first sanctions were put on Russia after they seized and, uh, and uh, annexed Crimea, where did Putin go? He went to Shanghai, 
where he signed a deal with the Chinese to build that Power of Siberia uh, pipeline. Uh, and uh, the Chinese drove a really hard bargain. Uh, they got, you know, they got that gas a lot cheaper than Russia wanted to sell it. And since then, uh, I think that we're going to see as these sanctions cut off Russia's economic connections with Europe, with the United States, uh, Russia will become increasingly an economic dependency of China. Well, it's it, it, arguably that's already happening. I mean, this is the interesting reversal of the old Soviet adage of having vassal states by virtue of you know, economic, not military power. And as you pointed out, Russia's such a tiny economy. China's now the big, the big dog in the world economy, equal, co-equal essentially to the United States. So that's, that's a, that's a non-trivial shift. And as you, as you know, and you write in your book, China's an importer of oil and gas. It's an exporter of the so-called green energy materials and machines, uh, which is no, there's no accident on that transformation, of course, but, Let's stick on oil for a minute before we go to the transition, which we have to talk about, of course, which you, for which you receive some heat when you published your book for not being sufficiently enthusiastic about the transition. But we'll, I, I would hope the word would be realistic. But <laughs> you and I are both, I think, trying to be realists, but the political narratives don't always allow realism, as you as you know, in this field. But you know, on on oil, the oil fungibility is is Russia not only finds the difficulty selling its oil, um, again, as you write and you know, the uh, Russia's ability to produce oil in the, in the very hostile environments of the Arctic is compromised by the absence of the scales of the Western oil companies, which really are the, at the pinnacle of those capabilities. And they're just not going to do it anymore. So their, their oil production is going to go down, even non-sanctioned from buying it because they, they just don't have that capacities and probably can't learn them in time frames that have any meaning. So when you wrote, I'm going to do another quote from your great book, Dan. Uh, Saudi Arabia may hold the largest reserves of conventional oil and will continue to be the lowest cost producer. And so it will have a long-term competitive advantage. Well, you know, uh, I think the Saudis are going to be much more eager to fill the gap made up by the loss of Russian supply. I'll just say, again, being as a pessimist at the moment, even though I, as you know, my podcast is called The Last Optimist. (laughs) At the moment, we seem less eager to fill that gap. And it's just hard to imagine that the Saudis won't be the first to try to fill a gap. They have the capacity. Yeah. Well, I think where's the growth, the main growth will be, where's the main growth going to be? It will be in the U S the U S may add as much as a million barrels a day of oil this year, which is more than the rest of the world combined would add in terms of new capacity. But Saudi Arabia uh, is, is committed to spending some significant amount of billions of dollars to expand its capacity to fill the void or the vacuum that will be created by less oil coming from other places. And the UAE, Abu Dhabi is another country that's spending money to expand its capacity. So they're looking at the long-term market for oil. And I think, uh, frankly, if you see Russia go down, Mark, as you suggested, it will go down. Uh, that's going to create a need for more oil from other parts of the world because oil demand will continue to grow as long as the world economy is growing, at least for another decade. Well, and that's one of the principal takeaways in your book is that uh, no matter how what one's aspirations are or, or convictions of what has to happen to reduce oil use, the magnitude of the oil dependency because of its efficacy, I would call it technical and economic efficacy. It's not just economically effective energy source. It has a lot of technical virtues that are remarkable, easy to store, easy to ship, easy to convert, uh, safe to store and ship by all other standards. I mean, all all kinds of merits. And and energy density. Energy density, the only thing that exceeds it is it really annoyingly hard to handle liquid hydrogen and and nuclear energy. So the density and the features are extremely difficult to replace. In fact, I've said before, that if oil didn't exist, we'd have to invent it. Right. It and we're trying to invent a replacement that's plug compatible. Not so easy because it has to be all metrics. But if you think about where the world is going and at the velocity that we can do this, you can't help but reach the conclusion that oil is going to be important for a long time. Even if you accelerate the quote transition, even if when I look at the IEA's uh, aspirational forecast for what I'm calling a double down, which in fact our president, it's called double down strategy and use words that effect. And the EU president said we have to double down. So everybody's talking about double downing on green, but 
even then the world will still get half of all its energy in 2050 from hydrocarbons with oil and gas, the dominant players, of course, overwhelmingly. So you have to ask the question geopolitically and economically, who's supplying it, right? Who, if we have a moral, economic, geopolitical question, you'd have to say, I can embrace, let's just be bipartisan in the sentiment here. Uh, I don't mean political bipartisan, I'm talking about bipartisan on the aspirations for getting rid of oil and gas entirely and those who don't want, don't want to do it at all. If you're just cutting it in the middle, where it's not going away. Surely we should be doing things to ensure the United States is a low cost, reliable supplier to the world that's going to need this stuff. I, I think there's a great reset coming, but I think it might take longer than, well, let's just say a year. It might take more pain yet in commodity markets and oil prices. I mean, if Russia, Russia loses 10% of production and, and Saudi Arabia doesn't step in to match it, a million barrels will not going to, it, it will just barely match it. If they go down another 20%, which I think they will, I think we're going to lose a third of Russian supply. Last time we lost that much oil to world markets, prices went up an awful lot. Right. Well, I think that I think uh, that's right, that you start to look at these numbers because it's not that just, first of all, you have a natural decline in oil production anyway, so you have to replenish that. And then demand will grow. And so where will that supply come from? Uh you know, some of it will be offset by electric cars. Some of it will be offset by more efficient automobiles. But, you know, it will be a relentless growth as long as the de emerging markets, the developing world is growing. And so that supply and, you know, you have to do this counterfactual. If the U.S. was still back where it was in 2008, importing 60 percent of its oil. Yeah. I mean, what would the world look like today? It'd be well, we, you, we know the answer to the rhetorical question. The price escalation would be off the charts. It'd be like 1973, 74, when when energy markets were interrupted by another political event, right? It was the, the Arab oil embargo was a political event for reasons many people know. The reason for the politics is less relevant than the consequences, which would 400% escalation in the cost of a barrel in less than a few days, a week. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, well, and um, here in a way, you know, it's, I mean, some of the people listening will remember the 70s. Some of them have read about it. It's a few of remember. Yeah, it takes on this iconic quality where people talk about it who only read about it because it was a sort of iconic disruption. This could be worse what we're in now because it involves not only oil, but it also involves natural gas. Exactly. It also involves actually coal. Yep. And it involves a standoff between the world's two nuclear superpowers. And right. that was not happening in 1973. Yeah, you know, you nailed it, Dan. I, I've been saying privately, both of us may write publicly, you have about this. I think there have been so far since World War II, two shocks to the world's energy system of, of you know, global epic proportion, the two of the 73, 74 and 79 <clears throat> Iranian revolution, which took about what, 6% of world oil supply off the market, five or 6%, which is roughly what Russia's close to 10%, right? So we have, let's say, see a mortar magnitude. But when you add an equal magnitude of natural gas coming off markets, and right. never mind the fact that the two nuclear states facing off, just the economic impact doubled, or the, or the risk is doubled. And yes, absolutely. I think the... Uh, Everyone's keenly aware of uh, the risks of escalating here. I, I was, as a young uh, staffer in the Reagan White House Science Office a century ago, working in the Strategic Defense Initiative and the nuclear nonproliferation matters, because we, for obvious reasons, a nuclear war is unthinkable. And uh, we, we haven't made a lot of progress, really, in any fundamental way <clears throat> in reducing that risk exposure it's a very tough one to but we've never had a confrontation since the cuban missile crisis that feels like this it's like the cuban missile crisis combined with the oil crisis of right. right yeah that actually that's a that's a good way to to put it mark because mm -hmm. and it's not just um hypothetical it is that either three or four times now putin has talked about using either directly or indirectly nuclear weapons very um very reckless of him uh, and obviously meant to intimidate and scare, uh, but it does highlight, uh, you know, that the that the risk of escalation, either intentional or accidental. I mean, things can happen accidentally that escalate, and the communication now 
I don't think the hotline is operating between uh, uh, the White House and the Kremlin anymore. I think there's less communication now. Uh, it, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, you had, as I remember, Anatoly Dobrynin, who was right. the Russian ambassador, meeting secretly with Bobby Kennedy. I don't think we have those back channels going right now. I, I mean, you, this, you nailed it. This is in the age of the Internet and the cell phone. We actually have uh, less communication, uh, both back channel and direct. I couldn't agree with you more. One of the things that we called warriors, I was in the weapons development side as well, you know, anti-missile stuff. Everybody worried about and what novels were written about, you know, fail safe, right? right? You, right. You, you worry about mistakes in communication or unintended, you know, somebody making, just being impetuous, uh, sitting on the hair trigger. And you know, we've, we've, I'm a, a fear we've lost our capacity in some sense for realizing how horrific nuclear weapons are. And, and you're right. You know, Putin has been, that's reckless to threaten that, but this is what's worrisome. It was reckless to invade Ukraine. Well, well, you'd look at it and basically what enormous number of miscalculations. He miscalculated uh, the quality of his own army. He miscalculated. Uh, he thought that the Ukrainians would welcome them with flowers, not with resistance. <laughs> yeah. He miscalculated the unity of Europe despite its dependence. He thought because of their dependence, they would just follow, you know, they would protest and then sort of sort of quietly acquiesce. Uh, he missed... Uh, he miscalculated about the U.S. He looked at January 6th, said this is a divided country. There's no, not yep. going to be any willpower. Uh, but he and, he and he miscalculated in the sense, at least so far, that the game's not over, that the tightness in the world oil and gas markets made this a very advantageous time to strike. Yeah. Now, we've already seen, what is it supposedly, the head of one of the divisions of the KGB or its successor has been, uh, uh, has been put in, in prison yeah. uh, for bad advice. That's, you know, that's a high... Yeah penalty, bad advice, you go to prison. Uh, and supposedly 100 uh, uh, of these officers, FSB officers, have been put on leave. I mean, yeah. he's going to be looking for scapegoats. And in a sense, he's going to become even angrier and angrier and more and more filled with hate. Well, that's that's obviously what's frightening about the situation and, uh, and why I, I hope that Rio Politik re-enters the strategic energy plants of Europe. In fact, it lets me turn to another quote from your great book. <laughs> this is the right time to promote your book now. I'm telling oh, thank you. Thank you. People, people haven't read it. You got to read it now. If you didn't read it last year because it wasn't sufficiently enthusiastic with the transition, and it's, I, you know, you're, I, I'll say, slightly more enthusiastic about the prospects than I am, or, or optimistic. I, I have a more pessimistic view of, of what can actually be done. But a lot of stuff's going on. But you wrote then. The EU's Green Deal aims to make net zero carbon legally binding for the continent by 2050. And, you know, the kind of legal binding puts straitjackets around the businesses to do something in these time frames, especially the next decade or two. You, I think they're going to have to soften that. I've seen some evidence of it, I think. Do you think they're going to soften that just because of the the seriousness of what we've been just been talking about with respect to I, I think we see it. I mean, well, yeah, they did they have this thing called the taxonomy, which is their basically it's their Bible for for government allocating, directing the flow of capital in the energy sectors where the money goes. And they just had a big before the invasion, they had a big battle royal over uh, natural gas and nuclear. Right. And uh, Paris, which uh, you know, France gets, what is it, about 80% of electricity from nuclear, wanted to keep the nuclear option there. Germany, which had voted, you know, had decided to get rid of nuclear, said no. France prevailed on that. Yeah. Also, the other thing that was significant was that gas is going to, initially there was an effort to just say gas is not acceptable. They changed their tune. Yeah. And in fact, Chancellor Schultz in his famous speech of about six weeks ago, where he uh, uh, talked about the Zeiten Wende, the, the ter change of eras, announced that Germany is going to build three terminals to receive LNG, yeah. natural gas. They've been talking about it for 20 years, and he said they'll get it done in two or three years. That is a change. So I think you already see a modulation going on and um, and a recognition that you have to deal with economic realities. Yeah, I think, and that, that does feed into my optimism because the, those moves... And, and they can, you know, the Germans are darn good at this kind of stuff. If they decide to build those, they'll, they'll, 
I would not be surprised to see those terminals online in 18 months to two years. It's not not inconceivable. Um, much easier to, to build more of those and then gigawatts of right. wind farms. Well, so t just two two qualifications. One is supply chains, and the other and the more important one is permitting. Well, in, I think the Germans are more likely to accelerate, to, let's say warp speed, to use that now <clears throat> politicized term, they're permitting. The, the collateral permitting problem is going to be here to get them the get them the gas to, right. to take off a ship somewhere. If we don't move, I mean, Qatar is obviously expanding uh, their capacity. Australia seems like they want to do it. <clears throat> we certainly have the capacities globally to do this, to delink Europe from Russia. Uh, it will be interesting to see how it plays out. Let me let me turn to a part of the equation that isn't changing, and I don't think it. I don't I want to need to argue that it has to change the, you know, the enthusiasm for windmills and, and Tesla's which is fine. I mean, the challenge is, as you wrote briefly in your book, but and, and you, and I've talked about this before, the challenge with that is also supply chain, right? It's a different supply chain. The supply chain there is in another industry that's, that's uh, the moves at the pace of a sloth, the mining industry. And uh, we need a lot of minerals and you wrote correctly. As they grow, wind, solar, and EVs will need big shovels, in quotes, <laughs> to meet the increasing call on mine minerals and land itself. Uh, you, you, a couple of good quotes about needing how much material you need to, you know, the million, the half million pounds of mining to produce minerals for one car battery. Right. Which, well, well, Mark, let me say, first of all, you know, we're seeing now, you know, they just had these congressional hearings where once again, they started going on about, right. you know, price gouging, all the, uh, I have to say, by the way, I looked in my earlier book, The Prize, and just, and found, I had it there, that the first congressional hearing that I could find on high gasoline prices was in 1923, 99 years ago. <laughs> and you could have used the same script from there in the one in 2022. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, uh, but, you know, but they always talk about big oil, but going to what you just quoted, it's going from big oil to big shovels. And of course, you have been as, at the forefront in identifying the challenges about mining, as opposed to just doing a PowerPoint and assuming if you do a PowerPoint, the stuff is there. Well, it's actually not there. It actually has to be mined and transported and processed and so forth. And you've really set the pace in terms of actually saying what's involved in meeting these material demands. Well, and your, you know, your firm has issued some very useful analyses of the state of play, which is important uh, to look at the call on minerals. And we're not talking about the obvious battery centric minerals like lithium and cobalt. But the call on the common minerals, nickel, copper, aluminum, that we already produce at enormous scale, the call on those minerals is enormous. And your, your own group put out a very uh, eye-opening forecast, not predicting what would or wouldn't happen, just predicting what the magnitude of demand for those and that there is no evidence yet of a commensurate appetite to increase mining, either spending the money or to go back to permitting, making the permitting possible. The Europe and the United States are still very hostile territories to try to open a mine. So we are, we're shifting dependencies, again, as you write about, to those nations that will mine this stuff, which is heavily in Africa and South America and Asia. <clears throat> but more importantly, who will refine those things, just like oil has to be refined to gasoline and other products. Mine minerals have to be refined into useful chemicals and the last I checked, I think this was this is your I think it's your firm's data. In fact, I'm pretty sure. So credit where credit's due. The percentage of uh, the world's supply of all the critical refined chemicals, refining nickel, cobalt, lithium, and uh, copper, uh, China enjoys a dominance in that greater than Saudi Arabia's dominance in oil. Yeah, I believe that the number for copper is that 70% of the world's copper is smelted in China and Saudi Arabia produces about 10% uh, of the world's oil. So it's quite a difference in that ratio. It's, um, and this is your territory. If we're drawing, you need to do a sequel book now uh, on the, the, the map revisited and include more of the map on the minerals because we're even, even without the hypertrophied green plans, Minerals are critical for everything we make, and the concentration of supply is incendiary, just as you've described for other commodities. 
Right. right. And, and, and so, you know, we know we've been talking about the geopolitics of oil and gas. It goes, and certainly that's been something that's been persistent for decades. But I think we're going to be talking a lot more about the geopolitics of minerals and metals, uh, the geopolitics of the new supply chains for net zero carbon, because as you suggest, uh, they're just as political. And, you know, somebody said, you're going to pay, have to pay a lot of attention to the outcome of the next election in Chile, because that's where a lot of copper comes from. Well, the current indications are that you know, you've, I'm sure you've seen, again, then again, it may have come out of your organization, the, the miners there have put on a, a, on the sideline their expansion plans pending understanding the political landscape and where they're operating before they make commitments for the billions required to expand both lithium and, and copper production. And similar things are happening in other parts of the world where there's been political shifts. And a lot of nickel comes out of Indonesia and and they've announced recently that they intend to build refiners in, uh, in their territory to capture a supply chain and not export nickel to other places, not just to China, but to us. And meanwhile, we recently saw the administration novate a permit, eliminate a permit for a new nickel mine in Minnesota. So we have this odd, uh, not odd, it's not, not surprising, but we have this juxtaposition of unrealism, frankly. Right. I, I didn't know about the nickel mine, but I, that's very interesting because I was struck that, you know, the Biden administration came out in May with a report on minerals and metals, uh, expressed a lot of alarm and saying we have to really change our position. And then it kind of went on because China dominates electric cars. I, you know, I wasn't quite sure how that connection worked. But the question <laughs> is, having raised the alarm, but if you can't permit it, if you can't build a mine, I think there's an example of a copper mine in Arizona Correct. which has spent a decade or more than a decade and more than $2 billion trying to get a permit and it still hasn't gotten started yet. So it's kind of a negative if your company, it doesn't really encourage you to, uh, to allocate capital uh, to that wow. venture if you can't get there's, anything done. There's a, a uh, the pinnacle of e euphemistic gentle diplomacy on your part. Uh, <laughs> if, uh, it, it, you know, we're, there won't be a, a, an ounce of new copper mined in America if we don't fix this problem yeah. and we'll just have more dependencies. I, 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 I'm I, optimistic too that we'll fix that. I think you're right. I mean, Senator Granholm, when, when she gave the opening remarks in the latest IEA summit in March, <clears throat> talked about there was a single, there was only one line, but we'll, I'll credit the administration and the secretary with including the line that we shouldn't trade one dependency for another, meaning the mineral dependencies. So, that the awareness is there, the will to do something politically seems still to be absent. Right. Uh, we had a, a Sarah week, we had a, a forum that the Secretary of Energy and others were involved in, uh, the head of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, just talking about the issue of permitting and getting things done, even, you know, even the permits for uh, cables for offshore wind. And we had the head of uh, the French utility there, and he kind of scratched his head and said, Well, in France, you know, the, whatever their version of the Supreme Court just kind of decides and we get on with it. And it led one to explain that in order to address these energy issues, you need to not only be an engineer or an <laughs> economist or so forth, you also have to be a constitutional scholar to understand the complexities of the American political system. Right. That's a, that's a, a good line. And, and it'll bring me back to repeating my line that presidents have a pen. And this is the thing that presidents with the cooperation of Congress they, they don't know how to open a mine if their life depended on it. And it might, by the way, their political life, but they can sure write legislation and sign it to make it easier. And uh, the fact that it takes a constitutional <laughs> legal scholar and millions of dollars of legal fees, maybe billions in some cases, it looks like, uh, is, no, is no easy path to, the, to, to uh, let's say supplying the transition never mind about what it actually costs that's a separate issue you, you whatever the cost of copper and of course copper prices are way up because of of demand good deal that demand came from more wind and solar and batteries <clears throat> let me let me go oh, sorry dan go ahead. no i, I was going to say electric cars are going to really add a lot of <laughs> copper demand that's we, we have our copper study that we're working mm -hmm. on now and it, it follows on what you've said uh uh mark about looking at what is the demand for materials if you have those targets and they're very high? And then you look at, well, where's the supply? That's down here. And so yeah. 
It's a so, huge, huge discrepancy. Yeah. I, you know, there, there's a lot of different estimates on this, but it looks to me like the the net increase in pounds of copper per car is sort of the hundred pounds, 150 pounds per EV more than is in a regular car. Regular cars have copper for the electric systems, but EVs are all electric. So they have a lot more copper, but if you make, and you can't replace copper, you can use aluminum, but it's not as good a conductor for low voltage, but you can. But if you just take copper and you do 10 million cars a year, then 20 million cars a year times a hundred pounds, you don't have to be a resource economist to know this gets you to millions of tons. These are big numbers. Yes. Uh, right. Let me let let me turn to another quote from <laughs> the sagacious book. <laughs> <laughs> this will be our, our closing quote. I won't beat you to death with your own quotes, but it really I don't, I'll say it again. Uh, you know, it, it's a lot of fun. You know, you've been very generous about the book that I published on the heels of yours, which is only only has a few chapters on energy. But when you write a book and you're trying to think about the future, sometimes the future catches up to you pretty fast, and you're aware that could happen. So you. you you have this sort of, you feel, I don't know, schizophrenic or mildly punch drunk or something. Because when you put something out, a statement that's pretty firm and the world might not go in that direction in a time frame that people are still reading your book and you don't want to feel like an idiot. On the other hand, you feel pretty happy if you got it right. Well, it's, it's interesting because I look at it now and, you know, at the time, I think even the editors sort of wondered, why are you spending so much time on Russia, Ukraine, Putin, <laughs> natural gas. And it was just a sense that this, you know, you don't know where things are going, but you can see the direction that they're going. Yeah. And I felt that. And the other big theme in there is the US-China relationship, how dramatically that's changed in five or six yeah. years and where that's going. And although that's not getting all the attention now, it's sort of a sideshow to Ukraine. It's very noticeable where China is on this and what yeah. the relationship between Russia and China is. And clearly the Chinese are going to be studying these sanctions very, very carefully. You know, they set up an institute after Gorbachev uh, to study what went wrong with Gorbachev and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Yeah. Well, they may, for all we know, set up an institute to study sanctions and the way they've been applied because this is, this is a massive use of sanctions that also depends very heavily, of course, on the primacy of the dollar, which um, uh, these other countries want to challenge. I think you, you nailed it. And I, I would suspect they've already, at least secretly, functionally set up such an institute to study the impacts because the, um, <clears throat> China is an export economy. Uh, it, it's not an internal economy like the United States, uh, as, as you know. We, we produce on a net-net basis roughly 85 or 88 percent on an economic net net basis of everything consumed in the country. And technically we could probably produce it all. We got, it's not like, whereas China is the inverse. They have to export stuff to fuel their economy. And, uh, and right now they're the dominant exporters of solar modules, 80% plus, as you know, a lot of the wind turbine components, they're at a sort of 50% market share, <clears throat> battery yeah, chemicals. Yeah. Lithium ion batteries. Huge, yeah. huge, big, biggest market share, full stop. So I, I, you know, what we what they're while they're studying the impact of sanctions that could happen if they did something we didn't like, you'd hope we begin studying <laughs> the potential kinds of events that could emerge in the future for which we would face a uh, supply interruption in sanction challenge equivalents to what Europe is now facing with oil and gas. And I, I don't well, see evidence of that happening. Yeah, yet. well, that's yeah. why, you know, if I think about it in those terms, just in terms of the new map, What's the other area? I mean, I focused, I didn't think about it this way, one arena of conflict around Russia, Ukraine, gas, Europe. The other is the South China Sea. I, as I was writing the book, I just became almost obsessed with it. It's the most important waterway for economic terms because one third of world trade goes through exactly. it. And I, I have uh, as an appendix this essay I wrote about the four ghosts who haunt the South China Sea because you can see you know, if you say, where's conflict likely to arise between the U.S. and China? Obviously, Taiwan is an issue, but we've had several near collisions in, in uh, the South China Sea. And there are two fundamental different views. The U.S. and the other countries in the region say this is a high seas, it's freedom of the seas. And the Chinese says, no, it's our territory. And those are two con con clashing realities. Two, that's where nations clash. No, well, that's, I mean, this is why I think the title of your book nailed it. Because if you look at the things that are real, civilizations have to have to survive and grow. And you look at where the flows are going. It's a, it's geography. It's a map. And that tells you where potential conflicts can occur. 
It's what happens in Europe. And uh, let me let me let me turn to one last quote because it's a good a good place to wrap up philosophically, uh, if not politically. Um, towards the end of your book, you, know, you write, in short, for the next few decades, the world's energy supplies will come from a mixed system. Fair enough. One of rivalry and competition among energy sources. True. In this system, oil, oil, <clears throat> excuse me, oil will remain, maintain a preeminent position as a global commodity. Still the primary fuel that makes the world, makes the world go round. Boy, um, never were truer words stated without having a political position. And what I, what I would hope is that serious policy analysts, you know, read your book and think about the, the political dynamic because we're not going to bend the realities you outline, the politics and the map. The geography is what it is. The physics density of oil is what it is. The challenge of minerals for wind and batteries are, are what they are for a long time. And if you're not realistic, we really create potential for messes. We, but we, you know, we're not stupid in America. I mean, there's a lot of serious people who aren't in the public fray, let's just say, giving good advice to both political parties. Do you think, <laughs> this is not a political question, it's just, a, I'm curious. Do you think both both parties, and I include Republicans, but the Democrats, because they're in charge right now, are listening to their thoughtful advisors now, given the x-ray of Ukraine? I think there's been a big change that started in um, in, in, in November. Uh, you know, first when they went and asked the Saudis for more oil, and the Saudis said no. Uh, <laughs> and then looking, realizing that, in fact, the U.S. has the largest oil industry in the world, largest producer of natural gas, uh, will be the largest exporter of LNG and realizing that this is an asset. So I think it's kind of led to a kind of sort of a cognitive dissonance uh, given everything. But I think it goes to what you said, uh, as, as you were saying it, Mark, I was thinking about it. It's it's the, the realities of the physical world impinge on politics and, and people's ideas and so forth. And that is what is happening right now. Yeah, and, and and it happens episodically, and how we deal with it determines whether it escalates or de-escalates. Right. So I'm I'm praying for de-escalation for all the reasons that matter to to everybody. And uh, this has been very very interesting, Dan. And I thank you again for both writing the book, for joining me on this, and more importantly, I guess for you and listeners putting up with my <clears throat> sounds like my voice sounds like I had a rough night with cigars and alcohol. <laughs> I, I, I wish I could say that's what happened because it would have been a lot more fun. To, and I know well, COVID it's just anyway, it's, it's yeah. Paul. I'm blaming on Paul and, and, and nature again, the physical right. reality, the, the physical, world. the physical realities. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mark, for this chance to continue this discussion and uh, to keep in mind through all these difficulties. Yes, we deal with, try and deal with realism, but I like also your focus on let's also retain some optimism. <laughs> That's kind of you to say. So <laughs> appreciate it, Dan. Thank you. And Thank so you. before I, I, I close, uh, let, me, let me permit me to note for those of you who, who uh, would like to see and uh, hear this episode on my podcast, The Last Optimist, you can find it on Apple iTunes or Spotify or whatever your podcast platform. It's another way to hear it or share it with your friends and colleagues, your relatives. You know, it's, uh, these are important things that Dan's saying. So I, I also invite you to browse the Manhattan Institute website, the research and subscribe to the newsletters. And, and if you're able, obviously, the Institute would like you to consider supporting them because they have a link at the, uh, the simulcast here. And is a nonprofit organization and Obviously, the work that they do and support me and other scholars depends on support from people that are watching this and uh, intellectual support from great people like Dan Jurgen. So with that, I sign off and thanks, Dan. And thank you for all for watching and listening. And thank Mel you, Mark. And thanks, everybody. Thank you, Dan.